Greetings, everyone. This is Dave. I am so glad you're joining us today for this uh, workshop. You know, we've all been trapped indoors for uh, quite a while now. And, uh, you know, the, the, there was an adjustment period, but five months in, I think we're all finally getting to the third tier of our to-do lists. <laughs> and some of these tips that we're going to be sharing today, you know, maybe represent that second or third tier, although we think that many of them are very important, a very important part of your financial hygiene. Um, and so we want to share them with you. We are going to, there's going to be a little bit of a how-to element to this workshop, but I want everyone to understand that we are 100% available um, now and forever <laughs> to walk you through any of these personally. And uh, um, they can't see me nodding my head and agree. That's why you stopped and looked at me. Yes. Honestly, I'm going to tell, I'm just going to confess that we intended to all be on video. And uh, unfortunately, we're not. But it wasn't because we didn't want you to see our smiling faces. And I, as I said, right before we started, I put my lipstick on for everyone. So and that's a big deal. I, my face is done. My hair is brushed. I mean, I'm, I'm dressed in daytime clothing. And I was ready to so, be on camera. So we want you to use your imagination and imagine <laughs> that we all five of us look fantastic. I look like Christy Brinkley about now in COVID. And that's just what I've been working on. So you can picture me looking like Christy Brinkley if you want. So uh, we have, obviously we have an agenda. Uh, we have 11 tips that we would like to share with you for improving your financial hygiene uh, in the midst of this melt, this uh, pandemic i was gonna say meltdown, meltdown, but, but really well i do think there's an important point to be made here that this is all stuff that we as financial you know financial planning relationship we we address all this anyways right right it's just that what and i i've been thinking through what i wanted to say to everyone and i don't know if this topic arose from a oh there's some time to sit around and contemplate things and wouldn't it be wonderful to take care of these things or my goodness, there's some time to sit around and contemplate things. And I, now I'm really anxious about I haven't taken care of this, this, and this. So it's just a great, you know, the one way, one great way to deal with anxiety is to actually take care of the things that are making you anxious. So to, to go through this checklist, I think, um, you know, will will cause some, um, I don't know, better sleep at night if all of these things are taken care of. So, And we should emphasize that these are things that we always recommend doing. So... Um, you may well have heard these recommendations from us before, and this is just an opportunity to kind of drive it home and highlight it uh, and, you know, and just give you a sense of what the full benefits might be. So with that, um, Elise and I are going to reserve the right to like deal ourselves in and have Absolutely. some comments. Um, but in the meanwhile, I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the team to start taking you through our checklist. And Dave, before we begin, um, it looks like, at least on my interface, that the webcam option has magically become available. Um, do we all want to give this a shot and uh, oh, turn our cameras on? Let's give it a shot. Boy, I'm glad I didn't make up that point about putting on my lipstick. Because <laughs> <laughs> I could have said anything. I, but everyone's going to now know I don't actually look like Christy Brinkley, but there you go. They probably knew that. <laughs> There we go, there we go, look at that. Okay, well, we're actually very happy to be sharing our video with you. And I'm gonna repeat myself, I'm now turning it over to the rest of the team. Now that we're all present and accounted for, um, Lauren, if you could just go back a slide um, so we could make a comment about kind of why this Andrew Carnegie quote is a part of the presentation. Um, kind of the impetus for the theme of today's uh, discussion was this quote, watch the costs and the profits will take care of themselves. And so some of the things that we're going to be looking at are actual ways to monitor costs and therefore create financial capacity. Um, and other things that we're going to be looking at are ways to protect yourself against uh, some costs. I'm using air quotes and you can see me and that's great. Um, and then that way you'll be able to see some of the benefits of watching those costs as well. And on this slide, we're showing you the 11 financial hygiene boosters 
that we're going to be discussing today. We do not expect you to memorize all these as we're showing them to you now. We're not going to read through them all. We will cover all of these segments throughout the presentation. Um, we did want to take a moment just to mention there will be a recording available of this, so you'll have these slides. Um, we will also be sharing a checklist that will help you if you want to take advantage of any of these boosters, manage that process. Um, and lastly, just so it's fair warning, this will be an interactive presentation. So stand by, be prepared to engage. There will be polls um, along the way. So with that, uh, let's get started. All right, so I'm going to dive in and talk a little bit about Schwab Alliance. Schwab Alliance is your personal online access to your Schwab accounts that you can log into at any time from anywhere. Um, and I would say the biggest message here is that it saves you time and paperwork and really makes your life easier to have this access set up. Uh, you can see here it does provide increased security. So when you log into Schwab Alliance and set up your profile, you can choose to have two-factor authentication, uh, which we would highly recommend. And it's something that you can choose to have required every single time you log in or any time you log in from a new device that you've not previously logged in on. And, and it, how it makes your life easier. So there are a few different bullet points here that we'll talk about. First is e-authorization. So e-authorization is your ability to log into your Schwab Alliance account and approve move money requests. So you email us, you need money movement. We request it online, you log in, approve, and it's done. No more paperwork, no more printing forms, signing them, scanning them back to us, mailing them back to us, saves trees and time. And you can also sign paperwork. Almost all Schwab forms are now available to be signed through e-signature. Uh, it's really convenient. Again, you get an email. We prepare the form for you, send it to you. Schwab sends you an email. You click a link. You use it, that two-factor authentication, usually via a text message code sent to your cell phone that you then enter online. You complete all the different forms, pieces of the form that you need, whether it's just a signature and date, if there are initials or information you need to add in, submit it. It goes directly to Schwab. They process easy peasy. Again, nothing that needs to be printed, signed, scanned. Um, and a couple things about e-signature, a new thing about e-signature is you may be familiar with some notarization required on different forms. If you use e-signature with your Schwab Alliance, you do not need to get notarization on those forms that would otherwise require notarization when in paper. So again, saving you a lot of time, especially during the days of coronavirus when it's hard or can be scary to want not want to be around strangers, no notarization needed. One thing I'll jump back to e-authorization, a brand new change actually as of Friday or, the, or a week or two ago, if you request a wire, if you need to make a wire transfer, normally those are done with paper or e-authorization and they cost $25 each time. Now, however, if you do a wire transfer and you approve it via e-authorization, it only costs $15. So again, Schwab is really encouraging the use of Schwab Alliance and all of these tools and resources that can be done through Schwab Alliance because it is faster and easier, uh, but also a lot more secure for you to have that login set up and be completing transactions. Another couple quick things that you can do via your Schwab Alliance login is easy profile updates. So if you need to change your home phone number, cell phone number, office phone number, address, that's very easy to log in and change directly from there. You can also change beneficiary designations, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but one of the nice things about these profile updates is anytime you make an update, we at YesKibui get an alert so that we can confirm with you it was a legitimate change and then make the corresponding change in our records so that we know we have the right email address, address on file, and everything is consistent across those records. So here you will see a screenshot of what it looks like when you're logged in to your Schwab Alliance account. And this is where you would navigate to the security center. So this is where you would set up that two-factor authentication, also called two-step verification on different websites. And you can see in the bottom here, you can have the two-step verification trigger only when you sign in from an unauthorized device. So for example, I have, when I sign in from my laptop, I have it set up. If I sign in from a different computer or I'm checking from someone else's web browser, it's going to enforce two-factor authentication when I sign in from a new device. 
or you can set it up so that it requires two-factor authentication every single time you sign in. So that would be that text message code. No matter how many times you've signed in from your personal laptop, it's going to require it every time. And again, this is something we would suggest that you put in place. It's just that much more secure to have to have your cell phone in order to log into your accounts. And at the top there, you can see they actually have personalized security recommendations as you log in. So setting up security questions or updating your browser if it's not the most recent version. I'm going to, I'm going to just interrupt you for a moment, Lauren, to point out some of our attendees at this workshop are not currently clients. And so I want you to know that other than Schwab Alliance, the other 10 tips we're going to bring to you have nothing to do that have nothing that's uniquely about Yesky Bui clients. And wherever your money is, you you, you have the option for two-factor authentication. Yes. Good point. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a great point. This is specific to Schwab Alliance, but this will be the case at any other uh, institution where you hold investment accounts or checking accounts. And we'll talk about uh, reviewing your checking accounts in a little bit and all of your other accounts. So these rules of thumb or these hygiene boosters apply across all different financial accounts and logins. That's a great point. Thank you, Dave. We'll go to the next one. Perfect. So on the, I'm going to focus on the picture on the right hand side first. Again, specific to Schwab Alliance. And this is just showing you where you can make easy updates to your beneficiary designation. So you would click on the services tab and then the beneficiary sub tab. And this isn't something that you necessarily need to be doing frequently, but if something has changed in your desires and we've had a conversation about it and you've updated your estate plan, this would be a recommendation that your estate planning attorney and we would share with you would be to update those beneficiary designations on your retirement accounts to align with your wishes. It used to be something where we had to send you the form with all the information we had. You had to print it, add it, additional information, sign, date, scan it back to us. Now it's as simple as having that personal information for your beneficiaries and editing it and inputting it online. Again, this is one where we get an alert when that update is made so that we can then update our records and your beneficiary summary on your client private page. Again, assuming that's for clients. But this is also something that is convenient and should be done for anyone who has retirement accounts to make sure beneficiary designations are in place. And on the left hand side, is at, you'll, you'll notice it looks a little bit like an iPhone and it's a screenshot of the Schwab app. And the app is fantastic. It's really convenient. I have it on my phone. It's a really easy way to monitor things and take care of things from your phone, not even from a browser. It is also very secure in that you have to set up your login and use your two-factor authentication, but you can also use your face or your fingerprint based on what phone you have and what security measures it provides. So I have an iPhone and I use Face ID in order to be able to log in to my app, make sure that no one who just has my phone can get into my Schwab app, but hopefully they wouldn't be able to anyway since I have a passcode. One of the most convenient things I think about having the Schwab app is very similar to any of your bank any of your banks, the apps that they have, you can do Schwab um, check deposit right from your app. So you have to take a high quality picture of the front and the back of the check, the amount, and you can upload and deposit that check through your phone. I do this pretty frequently with my Bank of America app. So I know this applies to the other banks as well. It's just another point of convenience in having that secure app access. So to actually sign up for Schwab Alliance, and again, this is specific to Schwab Alliance, but is likely going to be similar to any, any online access you're setting up where you're going to access financial accounts. So there are two options for our clients for Schwab Alliance. First, you can go to schwaballiance.com and sign up, and you'll see right below the green login button, there's a new user, blue link, that's what you would click. But we can also instruct Schwab to send you an email with a link to set to do this setup. So if you'd like to set up Schwab Alliance, you can simply let us know and we can have Schwab send you that email right to your inbox. So you don't have to go find the website. Now, if you have Schwab Alliance access already or you set it up years ago and you simply don't remember what your login information is, you can use that forgot login ID or password blue link below login. Um, I know I have used this more than once and we'll talk about <laughs> passwords in a little bit. Um, but that is something that you can use that link to reset your information. You will need to know account specific information no matter which option you're doing, whether you're setting up a new account or retrieving account credentials. So you'll need a full eight digit account number for one of your accounts. You probably want to have the most recent statement handy so you can see the list of investment options. And you want to know obviously your personal information, date of birth, social security number, address, et cetera. 
Uh, this is something as well, if you don't have a statement on file, let's say you check everything online, but somehow you forgot your password recently, we can securely share a copy of that most recent statement with you, which would have the account address, the account number, and the positions in the account. Fabulous. Good stuff there, Lauren. So next up, our next tip to share is to sign up for Identity Force. And Identity Force is an identity protection service. They are one of the leaders in the industry in providing proactive identity, privacy, credit protection for all of your personal information and your accounts. Uh, they have been around for over 40 years, and we have been working with them uh, for about the past six. All of our team members have accounts with them, um, and anytime somebody needs um, some additional protection services, this is who we go to. So with an Identity Force account, they have sort of four services. There is monitoring. So this is continuous monitoring of your personal information. It includes fraud monitoring, looking for any change of address on your accounts, looking to find your name in any court records that may not be yours. They also scour the dark web, um, thousands of websites, uh, chat rooms in the black market, things that I wouldn't even know where to begin looking for. They are looking for my information to just detect if there's any illegal trading or selling of your personal information there. Um, and they also provide, it's kind of neat, a social media um, monitoring as well, which we will take a look at a little bit. So they well, really- Lauren, they I just have... jump in. We had, a, we had a special guest presentation, a webinar on identity protection and identity theft um, last year. And I, maybe you'll remember, but I believe our specialist then said that your identity can be bought for a buck on the dark web. Is that correct? It's something, it might even be less than that. Yeah, it was it was pretty shocking. So keeping that information safe, monitoring um, is of high importance, trying to be proactive before that information gets, gets out there. And so on the monitoring, if they do find anything, you will receive timely notifications and you can customize what this looks like. It can, they can send you alerts for anything from bank and credit card activity. They will send identity threat alerts if there's any major data breaches or identity theft instances, new identity theft laws, things like that they will send you alerts to, to notify you of that. Um, they have some fraud alert reminders as well. So you can place a fraud alert on your credit file if you think that you may be at risk, um, just to prevent anybody from opening an account or a line of credit in your name. Um, so with that constant monitor monitoring, they will send you these alerts to make sure that you are aware as soon as possible. And ultimately, this gives you some control, right? Knowledge is power. You have the control to see what others can see and learn about you online and do something proactively to try and limit what they can see. Um, they have some pretty neat um, anti-key logging systems, um, software that you could install so that when you're typing, it will obscure what that uh, what those characters are so if somebody was somehow able to see your screen or um, or what you were typing that is not a concern they have anti-phishing software they provide lost wallet assistance if you lose your wallet or lose your cards they can um, quickly cancel and replace those cards for you they have a mobile app similar to the to the Schwab Alliance app really handy just to have in your pocket available to you so that you can again content continue to have control over your information and if there was an unfortunate incident where a piece of your information was taken, uh, you are covered. They will help you recover it. Their two big pieces here are that they have identity theft insurance of up to a million dollars, which can cover certain out-of-pocket out of expenses, lost wages, um, things like that, just to, to help you regain um, full access of, of your information. Um, and maybe even worth more than that is um, their restoration services. They will do all the heavy lifting for you. They will complete the paperwork. They will make the necessary phone calls. They're the experts. They know what they're doing. Um, they will be able to, to have your back in an instance, in an instance like that. So pretty, pretty neat services there. And I also wanted to share just some um, brief screenshots of what it looks like to have an Identity Force dashboard. So you can see they're breaking it into four different categories of alerts. 
uh, focused on your identity, your financial information, your credit information, again, that social media, um, all of your, your social profiles. Uh, you can click into any of these alerts specifically and, and read more information. Depending on your settings, they can send it to your email or to your phone. Um, again, that rapid access to, to know what's going on is important. And again, a few more. This is what it looks like to um, some of the areas that they can protect your identity and scan for that. This is what their financial account information looks like. So in this example instance, they're monitoring two accounts. They have uh, looked at 246 transactions. Fortunately, none flagged on this, on this case. And just like on your credit card statement, you can see all of the different transactions. And there is a Not Me button available over here. So if one of these transactions is not you, you can start that process pretty, pretty quickly and easily. Their credit. Uh, monitoring is also really comprehensive. They focus on, uh, they pull information from the three main credit bureaus. Um, in addition to this, if you were to scroll down on their screen, you'd be able to see the specific information related to each of those accounts, um, last payment date, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's, it's pretty robust. And they also have um, your credit score. If you click on that tab there, it'll show you your score, um, when it was last updated, when the next update is available. Um, to make sure that, again, knowledge is power so that you are, you're aware of all of your information. And lastly, the social media uh, monitoring, which is pretty neat. You can uh, simply enter in your accounts and they will monitor for inappropriate activity um, to let you know if there is anything going on that doesn't look like you. They have two different accounts. One is their Ultra Secure, which uh, provides all of the identity, financial, and social media monitoring that we looked at. And then Ultra Secure Plus Credit gives you all of the, the credit information too. So it's a little bit, uh, you get a little bit of a discount if you pay for a full year upfront. Uh, but overall, I think just the peace of mind is, is worth it. Um, I know I really enjoyed having the, having the program myself. Um, so, and they are constantly providing updates um, to their systems. Now, I think their most recent is you can do a credit freeze straight from uh, straight from Identity Force, which mm -hmm. is a pretty convenient thing to have. And, and Lauren, I think it, it, I know it goes without saying with our clients, but it maybe it needs to be said anyways that we're not associated or affiliated with Identity Force in any way. We don't get a discount for our clients using this. We just actually just firmly believe in this system and want to make sure everyone knows how to use it. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of systems out there. There, you know, all of the credit bureaus have their own proprietary systems. There, of course, is LifeLock, which was one of the earliest and very famous and ones. We still think is a fine company. Well, so Elise and I, being a little bit sort of belt and suspenders, we use Identity Force, but we also use LifeLock. <laughs> you know, they just... seem to monitor things differently. We'll get different notifications from them, and um, and you know, I find that. That feels good to me. You know, they're just they're looking at different things. It's it's two layers, as you said, belt and suspenders. It's two, two layers. layers of of their insurance. I mean, this is a long time ago, but I remember sitting in our our house in Vienna and the phone rang. This was Identity Force. I'm pretty sure. Excuse me. This was LifeLock. I'm pretty sure. Calling and saying, "Hello, uh, Dr. Yeski. Um, are you in Cincinnati trying to buy a washing machine at Home Depot?" And he's like, uh, "No, I'm not." And they said, "Well, thank you very much. That's all we needed to know." So they do things differently and they're not that expensive. And in this, what, what I was saying to, to Dave the other day, is like, you know, we part of the premise of this webinar is not that people are no longer busy, but there is, there does seem to be a little bit of space maybe to take care of things like this. Well, you know, who else has a little bit more space? All the spammers and scammers and thieves. Thieves, excuse me. So it's even a better time or a more important time for us to be paying attention to this kind of thing. Right. And and the thing that one always has to remember is there is no there's no silver bullet. There's no perfect solution. You just have to monitor. You it. have to monitor. You you have to have good habits. And the team is going to continue to talk about some of those good habits uh, uh, through the rest of the rest of this webinar or this uh, workshop. Um, but it's nice to have one or more monitoring services that are out there keeping an eye on your identity and flagging potentially risky appearances. You know, again, this is where the, the instance Elisa just alluded to is like, 
they spotted that someone had submitted a credit request using my social security number and it wasn't me. So you can't have too much help. And this is just, I would almost say this is a starting point, not an ending point. And I'm sorry, Lauren, so please continue. <laughs> Oh, that was a great way to put it. Um, fantastic, real examples. We're going to head into our first poll as we continue along in our tips. Lauren? All right, so you, the only requirement is you have to be honest because it's anonymous. Uh, but we're gonna move into passwords as I alluded to briefly a few minutes ago. And the poll here is for how many websites do you use the same exact password? So Lauren will go ahead and Launch that poll on your screen. You should see an option. Seven plus. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm and so as those as those answers come in, you know, ideally we shouldn't use the same password on more than one website. Uh, but if you're anything like me, and I know I've talked to Dave about this a few times, it's really hard to remember a bazillion different passwords, different requirements. I'm, I constantly used to be resetting my password because I couldn't remember what I had used for a certain website, but it's really smart to have really strong password hygiene. Hey, Lauren. Um, yeah. Hey, Lauren, can you tell us how to make this work? Because we can't make any of the, our, our answer is seven plus, by the way, but. Yeah, so as, a, as an organizer, you can't choose. Oh, okay. oh okay. our attendees, but I'll add one to that for you. But well, as I can't of right now, for nothing. <laughs> you can't play. As of right now, we're about 40% with, well, 16% with password hygiene wizards. Good for you. There we go. 40% one to three websites, 24% four to six websites, and 20% seven plus. And that 20% would be a little bit higher with Dave and Elisa's number in there. <laughs> And so this is this is actually great. I, I'm a little I'm surprised by the results in a really good way. And one of the things that we'll talk about, we can go ahead and go to the next slide, Lauren, is how the heck can we be password wizards? Um, how can we have different, strong, secure passwords for every website that we use and not repeat them ever? And the answer is a password manager. And password managers have definitely increased in popularity in recent years. They allow you to pretty easily drastically increase your password hygiene and security to your access to all of your accounts. So most password managers have different levels. There's always a free version and then they're usually paid versions, but it allows you to save uh, passwords, login information, security questions for all types of logins. So we've talked about Schwab Alliance, Identity Force, your bank accounts, your online shopping access, your, we'll talk about a little bit, your social security online account, all of your different accounts and logins. Uh, it will it will save those for you and it will save things like your disney plus login your hbo max login your netflix login and all of those different things that again i still i can never remember those either uh, and you don't want to be using the same password even though hbo or netflix might seem like a harmless thing if someone were to hack there is information in your account that could be helpful to them they can see your email your address maybe the last four digits of a credit card so again just can't be too safe especially when using something like a password manager is so easy one of the benefits of these password managers is that they will also generate these very complex passwords for you so think about the password the, the default password that came with your last wi-fi router it was probably something like lowercase p capital b x dollar sign pound for 40 characters, nothing you could ever remember, but very secure and very hard to for a hacker to guess, it will generate those for you so that you can use those types of passwords for every website. The saving grace here is that it's okay if you have poor password memory. You need to remember one very, very strong password that's very hard for anyone to guess or hack. Um, it, and we'll talk about passwords, or sorry, that, that master password should be at least 16 or 18 or more characters. And oftentimes a passphrase can be a really strong password. So a passphrase is a phrase that you would say as a sentence or as a, as a fragment of a sentence, but something that people wouldn't know about you. Something that is not, you know, for example, I should not use the passphrase, my name is Lauren Stancil. That's pretty obvious. However, I could use the passphrase, I once saw a shooting star in Montana. It's just a sentence, but it's a story that may, and I totally made that up. Um, but if I had a memory about a shooting star in Montana that was a really special memory with family or with friends or alone, that could be something that's meaningful to me that would I would be able to remember, but someone wouldn't necessarily guess it unless I was writing it all over Instagram. 
Um, you could also use the, some other things I was brainstorming. Maybe you had an imaginary childhood friend or an experience, a vacation, a sport, something, some, some major experience or memory in your life that again, easy for me to remember, but not easy for anyone else to know or guess about me. And there's family sharing. So think back to that Disney Plus login. You save, save that Disney Plus login in your profile. You can share it with anyone else who has LastPass. So you can share it with your family members if you want to share that login, family login information with them. And I said LastPass. That's the, the password manager I use, and I really like it. And there are many more options, but some of the most popular are LastPass, Dashlane, and 1Password. So this is a quick overview, and I won't go through all these in detail, but just an overview of what LastPass provides. So again, I took screenshots specifically from LastPass because it's the one I use, but this is similar for all of the different uh, password managers out there. It allows you to simplify all of your online logins, including that online shopping. They actually have a browser extension you can download on your computer that you log into your LastPass account, and anytime a login box pops up, if you have a password saved, the LastPass box will pop up in there and it will autofill the username and password for you. Uh, when you change those passwords, it pops up and says, do you want to update this password in your LastPass? Or if it's not there yet, do you want to add this to your LastPass? Again, it will generate those strong passwords for you. And some of the, some of the options will allow you to store records and documents and share, um, share your passwords with others. And so here are the three options. Again, this is specific to LastPass. So there is a free option that allows you to save all of your passwords across all of your devices. So you can download LastPass on all any computers you have, your phone, your watch, your tablets, and it's free. Now, if you want to be able to share passwords, you need the premium version, which is only $3 a month. And that premium version also allows you to securely store files. And the family's version is $4 a month, and it gives you six of those premium licenses. So a family up to six can all have premium access and sharing with each other and with others. Uh, one of the things I think is really important to note is the sharing doesn't mean that you share every password with someone. It means you select which ones you want to share with someone, and then you have a shared folder, and you can see any passwords people have shared with you. And you'll notice there's also a business plans up there. So any of you business owners, you know how important security is for a small business uh, or a business of any size. And there are business plans where you can have this for your team, uh, for members of your team, and there can be sharing within the business plans as well. So if there are certain logins that everyone needs to have accessible, those can be part of the shared, and then people can save their various logins to their last pass as opposed to saving them on a piece of paper or in an Excel document or saved on a computer that they really shouldn't be automatically saved on. And one final slide here, this is just to show you what it actually looks like in LastPass. So again, this will look slightly different for other password managers, but this shows you there are logos for the websites. You can see right away, you can click on it. When you click on it, you can copy, or, copy and paste the username or password. You can show the username or password. You can edit it. You can add notes. So if you had security questions on a certain login, you could add those in the notes and they would be securely stored for you. All right, so taking that password and adding the additional layer of security, we've talked a little bit already about 2FA or two-factor authentication and just want to dive in a little bit more and take a look at what does that mean and how do I know which accounts um, I can even put that on and how do I do that? So what a two-factor authentication does is it takes something that you know, which is your password or your passphrase, and it requires that you also have some have include something that you have in your possession. That might be your cell phone. That might be an actual you know fob. It could be an app. Um, something that you have possession of, so that if someone were to try and get into your accounts, they would need to have that. And hopefully, your cell phone and those important items um, are on you and not available to uh, to a hacker. So it's just an additional layer of security. Um, to make sure that your accounts are nice and safe. So there's a pretty neat website called twofactorauth.org, um, and it provides a robust list of websites that do and do not support um, two-factor authentication. So you can either use their search bar in order to 
look for a specific account. I was looking for Gmail specifically, and you can see that Gmail is um, does have two-factor authentication. If you click the, the Docs button here, it would pop up a website to show you exactly step-by-step -step instructions on how to set up two-factor authentication on your accounts. And I picked Gmail. Email is a great place to start whenever setting up your two-factor authentication. I've read a number of articles about how much a hacker can get simply by having access to your email. Um, there's so many things they can change. and So securing your email is a great place to start. I will like say, me, I, I'm gonna jump, sorry, I was just going to jump in on that point, Lauren. Um, your email inbox is probably the weakest link when it comes to identity. Not hers personally. No. <laughs> I'm speaking to the audience. I'm speaking to one's, one's email inbox is the weakest link. And we have cut we have uncovered many fraud attempts because they happen perpetually. And almost invariably they somehow involve or start in the e email inbox because the amount of information once someone hacks your inbox, they can find emails that reference your credit card accounts, your bank accounts, communications with your, your financial advisors. If your accountant sent your tax return by email without it being right, you know, exactly. protected. So there's a huge amount of information that can be found in your inbox. And securing your, your email account should probably be job one. Job I'm one. gonna say job one, get that button down. And I, you know, we've, we have conversations with clients who, who have issues with this and uh, sometimes it takes them, sometimes once they lose control of their, their email account, it takes a long time to regain secure control. So start with your email account, definitely use two-factor authentication and um, you know make that priority one. Sorry, Lauren, please carry on. Sure. I was going to continue that if you don't know all of the different accounts that you have, I know many of mine slip my mind. Um, on this website, you can scroll and see and look at a number of different categories of accounts that are available. So if you click the back up and syncing, it would have a nice alphabetized list to show you uh, all of the different accounts. Oh, yeah, my Apple iCloud. I didn't even think about that. Um, and then helps you to, uh, to go in and, and figure out to make sure that that is secure as well. So I will pause here. This was um, a question that came to mind. We've shared a couple of different apps and programs uh, that we that we use, um, but always are looking for others that are out there. So please feel free to share a question uh, in the chat box with us. Um, we will either address it later on or we can again share in our final checklist um, any ideas and, and look into them. And with that, we go into our next poll. I needed to unmute myself so I could actually review the poll question with you. So. As a segue into our next section, which I'll be taking the lead on, the question is, how often do you access and review your accounts online? Options being every few months, once a week, once a month, every day, or whenever you think about it. Oh, lots of us are on the same cadence as the one that we use in the Abuja Dairy household, which is weekly. Very few responders indicating they look every day, which I think is healthy. <laughs> Could be overly cumbersome. Pretty evenly distributed. Well, thanks for running the poll, Lauren. Um, I'll go ahead and take over on this slide, and you'll note that there are two columns comparing and contrasting the approaches that two of our resident CFPs uh, take to managing their personal finances. Um, rather than going the chivalrous route and talking about Lauren first, um, I'll pick on myself and note that in our home, 
uh, which is a single income household. Not only is it my job to manage the finances um, for <laughs> my clients at work, it is also my job to manage the finances for our individual household. Um, when I asked Megan if she was interested in doing that job, she looked at me and said, you're the CFP, you do it. So given that that's the case, I've developed my own system that works. Um, and mine is 100% based on managing my own fears and anxieties. So come Monday morning, after a weekend of spending money um, anywhere that we visited, and I'm using that in the past tense because right now we're not going anywhere, um, I would wake up Monday morning with anxiety and have to review our accounts to make sure everything was in good order um, and as it should be. Now, Lauren was picking on me for this as we were preparing for this presentation because the way I do that is by reconciling all my transactions in a master spreadsheet. Um, which may sound old fashioned to some of you uh, listening in today, um, but it's the way that works for me. And then what Megan and I do is aspirationally talk about all of this once a week. Um, the review certainly does happen weekly again to manage my own anxiety, um, but it is important, of course, for all the members of a household who are participating in the spending of the household's money to converse about how that money is being spent. And to hearken back to the quote that we shared at the top of this call, um, I will say that we have found that putting additional energy into watching the spending has certainly created additional capacity in our cash flow um, mm -hmm. just by staying on top of it. Um, now, to contrast our approach against that taken in the Stancil household, uh, Lauren Stancil, the other CFP not named Dave or Elisa uh, on this call, um, <laughs> in a dual income household, chooses to receive text alerts for every I, single transaction I, that I happens on every account. Yes, please. Can I interrupt for two seconds? I just <laughs> want to go back to your, your reconciliation in a master spreadsheet that you said sounds old fashioned. You do understand that most of the people on, not most, but many of the people on this call, what would be old fashioned <laughs> is if you were doing it in an actual ledger book, okay? A spreadsheet is not old fashioned. I got your point. I just wanted to note that many of us have done this on yellow pads of paper or ledger book. For many you know, I actually have a checkbook right here. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> We had fun putting this together because the idea of a master spreadsheet reconciling everything and just my initial reaction was nerd, uh, but it works and that's what's important. So for us, you know, I receive text message alerts for every single transaction. So I know Yusuf will talk about setting up alerts and reviewing accounts. I have an alert for anything in any of my accounts, credit cards, whatever, for over $1. Um, and it, you know, that may seem nerdy overkill to some people, but it's, it's, it's reassuring to me. Every time I buy something, I get a text message a few minutes later and I'm like, okay, it's working. Uh, and that way, you know, right away, if something has been charged on your card that you didn't do right away, you have that knowledge versus checking, you know, some people say whenever I think about it. And that actually has happened to me before I checked my bank account, didn't get, didn't have alerts set up. And I had a fraudulent transaction from a few weeks prior because I hadn't checked frequently. And so that was something where if I had the alerts set up at that time would have been notified right away. Uh, my husband, Daniel, is similar in that he has apps for all of his various accounts and he has alerts set up to alert him through the app. So notification on his phone versus a text message. Very, very much the same thing. Um, and we, even though, you know, we are married, we, we mentally think about our money. It's all one big bucket, but we still have our own separate accounts. I think mostly out of laziness and not combining into joint accounts. And so we each have our own way of just managing our alerts and making things, making sure things are as we expect them to be. Um, and then, you know, quarterly or, or when we have planning items that are coming up, vacations, changes, you know, with coronavirus, there's obviously a lot of difference in our cash flow and in our, our leisure time. Uh, and so we have conversations about it and reconcile things and look at planning opportunities as, as they come up. Lauren, yeah, I think the critic you put alerts on with a $1 threshold. And I think that's really smart because uh, one of the things I've noted is that identity thieves, if they get access to one of your accounts, they will often put, try and put through a $1 charge as just to see if it goes through, and then they'll try and put through a much bigger or a right. series of much bigger charges. So even a $1 charge can be your heads up that something's wrong. 
I think the most critical thing from just the sharing of, of these two different approaches is to note that the thing that matters is that you check the accounts frequently and make sure that what's happening is what should be happening. Uh, and that's all that's happening uh, with respect to your accounts. Lauren, we can go to the next slide. Um, being mindful of the time we have remaining, I'm going to breeze through the next two slides a bit quickly. Um, we're going to talk about a couple tools that you can use to help you manage your expenses, specifically the recurring charges you have for subscriptions. Uh, now, if your household is anything like mine, uh, you may have thought that you were limiting the things you had to manage by maybe cutting cable and going to um, a different subscription um, service. Turns out that by cutting cable, we actually ended up signing up for an additional eight or nine subscriptions because I'm the HBO Max and Netflix person in my home. Uh, Noah, our young son, requires a subscription to Noggin so he can watch Paw Patrol. Neither Megan nor I watch Paw Patrol, and so um, that's a unique charge unto himself. And the list goes on and on and on for music and all the other things that you're subscribed for. The two trackers that we're gonna mention here uh, our true bill and on the next slide trim um, true bill requires you to link your bank accounts and credit cards to it for it to work it does not save your login credentials and then after you've set it up it scans your accounts for recurring transactions and source them as follows subscriptions bills and utilities and then other recurring payments and what you've got here on this slide is just a screenshot showing you what the interface looks like um, and Lauren, if you want to tab to the next slide, trim works quite similarly. The one big difference in security being that in addition to using Plaid API to keep your information safe, there also is the additional layer of a 256 bit encryption on top of trim. So ultra secure in that regard. However, and this is what makes it a non-starter for me, there's no app. So it's really in my opinion, a bit more challenging to use if you're looking to make this process efficient. Um, both have received high reviews um, and both are recommended by a number of industry experts as ways to help you manage those subscriptions for services that you're using or uh, to help you catch the subscription fees that you're paying for services maybe you're not using as much as you thought when you signed up. The next section here uh, that I'll be taking us through is just a quick tour of Credit Karma, the service. It is free. Um, the screenshot you're seeing here is a uh, picture of their website if you were to go to creditkarma.com. Um, Credit Karma is a great service to use if you want to gain a better understanding of your credit score and how your credit score has come to be what it is. Um, you'll also receive tips on how to improve your score. Um, Updates whenever your score changes, just a quick app update will show up on your phone. Um, and we'll also give you opportunities to assess different types of financial options that will help you improve your overall financial life. I'll talk about those a bit more on the next slide, but I'll use this opportunity to uh, give myself a bit of a hard time. Lauren Stansel mentioned earlier that one of the ways um, you could set up access to, was it, was it Schwab Alliance or, or maybe Identity Force? something where you could set up a face ID. And I mentioned that my phone doesn't give me that option, just the option to set up a thumbprint. And that's because I have an old phone. So with Credit Karma, you can set up access with any biometric scanner, whether it's a face ID scan or a thumbprint, um, whichever one works for you. And on the next slide, Lauren, we'll show the splash page. Once you set up a Credit Karma account, uh, when you log in, this is the screen that you'll see. And so I'll just give uh, all of our viewers a quick tour of what each of these buttons um, get, provides access to. The credit button is just like it sounds, provides credit monitoring and tips to help you improve your score as we mentioned on the previous slide. Under the accounts button, they actually break out all of your outstanding balances um, by account. And I will say that for those of you who are leasers of cars, do not be alarmed when you log into this segment and see an outstanding debt balance as a car loan. 
we lease cars in our house. I don't have any car loans that I'm aware of. And yet when I logged in, the outstanding amount of all of my lease payments due was listed here. Um, and so it's just one way that Credit Karma keeps track of all of your outstanding obligations. Um, other types of debt will be mentioned here, not just credit cards or auto uh, related loans, but student loans, your mortgage, and so on and so forth. Under cards, um, Credit Karma actually provides suggestions um, for the best cards that would match your usage uh, or needs, whether it's for balance transfers, uh, cards that carry 0% or other low cost options, uh, the best cards for getting cash back, the best rewards programs, etc. Under the loans section, you can shop for available mortgages uh, or personal loans in your area, and we strongly recommend connecting with us at Yeski Bowie if we're your financial planning team um, to help you sort through any options you may be considering. Under the auto section, if you add information about your car, um, you'll be able to get quotes on the best insurance policy and maybe refinancing offers on your outstanding auto loan. Under the home section, you'll, uh, they provide resources for folks who are shopping uh, for a new home and will actually do a buying power simulator um, to give you an indicator of what might be your price range. The savings button I don't think really applies unless you're interested in opening a savings account through Credit Karma. Um, and lastly, under the My Offers button, um, it'll provide options of, again, credit cards or loans that might be um, a good fit for you and that you may be pre-approved for. All right, I'm going to dive into Social Security. Before we do that, I'm just going to add one piece onto Credit Karma, Yusuf. Just Dave and Alisa, you were mentioning a belt and suspenders approach and how, you know, identity force may be the first of those options, but it's not the last. And Credit Karma actually does also send you alerts anytime it notices a new account, a new application for for using your credit, um, credit history or your credit, it will give you an alert. So that's yet another alert. Hey, there's something new in your credit report. Is this actually you? Is this legitimate? Um, and it will send you alerts on the phone when your score changes. It gives great reasoning of why your score is what it is and how you can change it. So that's another one I have, have alerts set up on the app through my phone. So, Social Security, there is also an online access to your Social Security records. If you, you may have noticed that you probably never get Social Security statements in the mail anymore. They are very rarely sent. And so creating an online My Social Security account is how you can access those statements and also, most imp very importantly, if you're not yet receiving benefits, how you can review your earnings history to make sure that it's accurate because that earnings history is what ultimately determines your Social Security benefit amount. Um, and one of the things that we're talking about a lot of these online access, uh, setting up online access to a lot of websites, something that was shared in the webinar Dave referenced earlier, setting up these accounts on your own makes it, that so no one, makes it so that no one else can go set up this account on your behalf. If someone were somehow to get a hold of your social security number and somehow get through all of the security questions to set up your My Social Security account, they then have control of that. And so when you set it up, you prevent anyone else from being able to set up that initial account access, um, which just which makes is, it a lot and, and just to be really clear, what Lauren is saying is that setting up online access to all of your financial right. accounts, including your credit cards and your bank accounts, even if you don't intend to access the information regularly online, by setting up online access, you block others from setting no it up. No one else can set it up. From right. setting it up on your behalf, right. exactly. Exactly. Thank you. So this, piece, yeah. So this PDF we will share in that checklist. So I'm not going to go through it. It just walks you through how to create your online My, My Social Security account. And the next slide will show us some things that you can do with your online My Social Security account. So first and foremost, you can get a copy of your most recent statement. And if and when you do that, we'd love to have it on file to use for your planning scenarios. You can also, if you're collecting social security benefits, you can set up or change the direct deposits of where your monthly benefit payments are sent. You can get your annual social security tax forms. You can get a proof of income letter and all the other items shown here. Um, and so that's another one. This is just one that, again, is really, we think is important to get set up with your information. 
It ha one thing I'll note, it has two-factor authentication or two-step verification every single time you log in. There is no option. It's required every single time you log in, and you have to consent to their um, agreement and rules that you are actually who you say you are using that account. So it's very, again, it's secure. You have to have your phone with you basically every time and get that text message code to log in. So back to me for this slide, and I'll just share a bit of a story um, from my experience with my wife, Megan, over the weekend. So we put this presentation together last week, and I thought, you know, I should take the advice that we're giving other people and actually sit down and, as it says on the slide, review the rewards programs that we um, have access to by way of the credit cards that we have. So I'm a Chase Sapphire holder. Uh, this is not an advertisement for Chase. Visa or any of the other brands that are going to be mentioned during this story. However, I was getting ready to get rid of my Sapphire card because it has an annual fee. I learned very recently that I can get a free subscription to Dash Pass, which is um, the DoorDash subscription for eliminating delivery fees. Um, that's covered. It's a free subscription if you have a Chase Sapphire card. So on its own, just being able to take advantage of that benefit alone uh, makes the annual fee uh, worth it for uh, with respect to carrying the Sapphire card. That's not the benefit that I learned about this weekend. I actually got that tip from Daniel Stancil a couple of weeks ago um, when he and Lauren came over for a socially distanced um, visit um, a couple of weeks ago. The story I'm going to tell you about from over the weekend is that Megan and I sat down and started reviewing all the other benefits of the Sapphire card and our United Mileage Plus card. Turns out that running through the end of September, you actually get five times the points on all Instacart orders if you place them using your Sapphire card. That's the only way we grocery shop these days, and so getting five times the points really matters right now. We had previously been doing all of our grocery shopping via our United Mileage Plus card, so we could rack up miles. But we also learned that you can do a one-to-one -one points transfer from the Sapphire card to the United card. And so why, why, why do what we were doing when we could be doing what we are now doing, um, which is maximizing the benefits of the rewards programs to which we have access? And so again, not an advertisement for Chase or Visa, just a story showing you that it pays to review your rewards programs. And so on this next slide, the, uh, the joke to use as a segue here is by saving all of that money or creating additional capacity by taking full advantage of your uh, rewards programs or by managing your accounts as we've talked about throughout um, other pieces of this presentation, you may find that you've got an extra dollar or two that you could spend and may be wondering how to spend it. Uh, a lot of the trends that we've been reading about and hearing about during this time is that people are spending more money enhancing the experience in the place in which they're spending the most time, their homes. Um, the top two pieces here of suggested ways that you might spend some money to enhance your experience at home, certainly by increasing your Wi-Fi bandwidth. Um, I don't know that anyone's ever had this many simultaneous connection points at home um, as they do now. Uh, another way, if you find yourself working from home, uh, to promote productivity and get the most out of your work from home experience, you might invest in a second monitor um, or a better printer, um, both of which I've done since uh, <laughs> moving to working from home full time. Um, <laughs> and I won't spend much time on this bottom bullet because we have some more material here uh, related to this. but. You know, everyone's spending a lot more time at home, maybe making more messes at home and probably spending more time cleaning than they were previously. Uh, so there may be some gadgets uh, that can help you keep your home tidy uh, as, you, as we continue through uh, this pandemic. Dave, Dave and I, Dave, yeah, Dave and I were, were lamenting, or just not lamenting, but just observing last night. It's like, my goodness, when you fix two or more meals a day, the dishes and the messy stove and the glasses and the oven blah, blah. it's like crazy <laughs> try having a two-year-old running around oh my goodness <laughs> no, 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 no. 
So I know we're at time here. We've got a couple questions already that we want to get to. So I'll keep this quick, but this felt like a really important thing to share as well. You know, if people are looking for date night ideas and this can be alone. It can be with a partner, with a friend, a sibling, a child, a parent, anyone, any number of people in any, any combination. Um, a money conversation date night would be our idea. And so Dick Wagner, who is one of the best pioneers of our profession and a very dear friend of Dave and Elisa's was known for saying money is the most powerful and pervasive secular force on the planet. And you know that we we exist to empower people to pursue their live big lives. And for us, live big is about the size of your life, not the size of your wallet. But money does affect many aspects, if not every aspect of our life. And we all grow up and we learn from those around us and our surroundings. We have money histories, we have money memories, and those subconsciously affect the way that we handle with, handle money as adults, the way we feel about it, the way we communicate about it with others. And everyone has those. So it's important to know that about yourself, but also about the loved ones in your life. So if you're looking for something that we think could be a really fulfilling and enlightening date night idea. We'll go to the next slide. Um, you know, we won't we won't rehash what our, all of our clients on the line know, but we believe the discovery process is really important. And for us, that's simply about getting to know who you are as a human being, what matters most to you, what gets you out of bed in the morning, and what the future looks like, what your biggest dreams are, so that we can keep those in mind as we work together along your journey. Um, and one of the tools that we use, you'll see on the next slide. So we partner with a company called Money Quotient that puts together discovery tools that we use not only in our initial discovery process, but in our ongoing work together. Uh, so many of you, if your clients have seen the Wheel of Life in that initial discovery meeting, and it, you'll also, you may recognize the Financial Satisfaction Survey and Life Transition Survey. And that's, we send those to you every year in advance of our annual update meetings because we, while we know a lot of the information on those forms, we wanna make sure that we're keeping up with any updates that may have come up since we last talked to make sure we're addressing those when we get together and kind of living in a world of curiosity about what's new with you and what's, what's changed since we last spoke. So the wheel of life is shows us nine different spokes or nine different dimensions of our lives. And the inner circle of that wheel would be a rating of a zero out of 10. And that very outer edge, that outer circle would be a 10 out of 10. And so the exercise for the wheel of life is to go through each spoke for yourself and rate your current level of satisfaction with that dimension of your life. And note, I said satisfaction. So it's about your level of satisfaction, not the quantity of something. So leisure may be all about vacations for you and you don't have a lot of quantity of vacations at this time, but your leisure life may have changed a bit and it may be really nice in this, in this season of life that we're all living through. And so the, the exercise would be for you, if you're doing it alone, to do it alone, or if you're doing it with someone else, each person to print and have their own wheel of life or pull it up on your tablet and use a, a marker on there and mark your dot on each of the spokes, then go around and connect the dots and see the shape of your wheel. And I will tell you, I don't think I've ever seen one that was really round and would, would roll like a wheel normally would. Um, so that's okay. And so then the exercise is to go to, you know, we find it most helpful and impactful to use open-ended questions to ask someone to just tell me about your wheel. Uh, the questions may be, what did you mark and why? What would a 10 out of 10 look like? What would have to change? Or what could you do to make that score a 10 out of 10? And a question, if you are doing this with someone else and, and you want to learn more and you're genuinely curious, one of the best phrases is, tell me more. Tell me more about that. And just ask people to continue to share uh, and really listen, because it can be really impactful to hear what's going on, what your current satisfaction is, and what might need to change or what might be changing. And while we may have conversations like this with friends or spouses frequently, a lot has changed, obviously, in the world recently, and priorities may have changed. So even if you've done something recently, it could be helpful to go through it again. So we'll do one quick poll here. If people are willing to share, what is your current level of satisfaction with your home? So that dimension of life. And I want to make sure that we know that you can define home however you would like across any and all dimensions. I um, mean, if anyone is willing, as after you click your poll, if you want to type into the chat or the question box, whatever is easiest, just a little more about what you rated and why. I can't help you from here. I can find it if you want me to. 
we'll give that a few seconds and I'll just share a little bit about my current level of satisfaction with home is very high. Uh, and yet I haven't actually been in my physical home since the beginning of June. And that's okay because I define home as where I am, who I'm with and what I'm around. So right now I'm on the East Coast. I am near where I grew up, which was a home for me. I had the pleasure of helping my sister move to Colorado. So any, anywhere I am with her feels like home to me, even though I haven't been in my own bed or in my own home since early June, still feeling very satisfied with my home, even though wherever I am in the country. All right, so we've got some responses here. So we've got a couple that are zero to two, 4%. Then we've got 30%, 5 to 6, 39%, 7 to 8, and 26% at a 9 to 10. Uh, and those are really great to see. And you know, for those, if we were, if we were in, Elisa said, my home is dusty. At least I think that was her. <laughs> that might be a lower score. Um, but there may be specific reasons why you rated that, and there may be goals or just short-term changes that could help increase those scores. And so on this on this money conversation date night, that would be a really good rating to say, ooh, tell me more about that. Why is, what's, what's that score? Tell me why you rated that number. I do think that there's probably no one who hasn't developed a new relationship with their home over the course of the last five months. I will say I have an entirely different relationship with my home as a consequence of being trapped between these four walls for the last five months. Absolutely, and we had we had one. Dusty. Yeah, we <laughs> had one more comment. The one comment here: our home is too small, so we are moving in October, and so that oh. might be something where the score is a certain number now, and then in October it increases. Now that includes moving, which can be a process, as I just lived through driving across the country and helping that out. But it is all worth it in the end, for sure. So one more quick thing we wanted to share here, um, Dave and Elisa, they have, as part of that differing relationship with their home during shelter in place, have used some of this time to upgrade their smart devices uh, in the form of their two iRobot Roombas who are very aptly named Agador Spartacus and Rosie. And so we have two quick polls for you here that we'll go through first. In what movie did the character Agador Spartacus star? Give a few more seconds. Oh, all over the board here. <laughs> all right. So, Dave and Elisa, final answer. And Ben Hur is a good guess. <laughs> the birdcage, though, is the answer. <laughs> He's the Agonar Spartacus is the the butler slash maid for the the gay couple who are they they run a, a um a uh, yeah a nightclub of uh, female impersonators and he can't walk he's a great maid butler but he can't walk when he puts his shoes on if he puts shoes on he falls over it's his outtakes in that or not outtakes his scenes in that movie are among the funniest scenes ever. So that's why we named our <laughs> first room Agador Spartacus. Wonderful. All right. Second quick one after whom is Rosie named? <laughs> I'm betting that this one is going to have more convergence. <laughs> I don't know, three, three of the answers have been chosen so far. But there's there's good consensus so far. All right. There we go. The From the Man. Jetsons. I actually saw a great, um, I don't know, a meme or whatever, comic strip, saying it was showing all the things it showed like four panels from the Jetsons. so one was a a telephone with a camera you know a camera telephone and another one and it's like well there we go finally we've caught up with the jetsons the one i want is the conveyor belt in the morning that takes you through and like 
you get showered and cleaned and dressed, your hair dried, makeup on, and you come out the other end, you don't have to do anything. That's the that's the one I'm waiting for. But uh, yes, yeah, I, I would like the hair machine. That's <laughs> the one I want. <laughs> Well, those were fun and take us to our last point uh, pretty nicely, which is to take care of your mental health too. Um, we're all going through so much during these during this year. Um, and here are a few ways from the National Institute of Mental Health, um, different ideas. I think laughter is a great medicine um, as we, you know, you can see that we have a little bit of fun here. Um, Another one that is important to Yeski Bui, though, is, is mindfulness and meditation. We find that to be an incredible gift to stay mentally alert, emotionally calm, and as supportive as possible to our clients and to each other. We have been practicing mindfulness and incorporating it into our personal and professional lives for years um, and have found it just to be particularly helpful in this year, given everything that's been going on. And so to kind of share those benefits with our clients, we have hosted two live webinars featuring meditation teacher and a good friend of ours, Jane Cunningham. She took us through the benefits of mindfulness, took us through an amazing guided breathing practice um, to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, ground yourself, cultivate concentration. If you miss them, we have recordings available on our website, and we will include them in our checklist. They were just fantastic. And we also invite you to explore the benefits of Calm which is a meditation, sleep, and relaxation app that, um, apologies, that many of us find to be really helpful. Not sure why if you want to hear Matthew um, McConaughey read you a bedtime story, calm is the place to go. <laughs> they, it's great. They have a really big variety of um, of content on there and guest instructors. LeBron James is also um, a guest instructor. I, I don't know who um, it so. is, but somebody somebody will read you like the London train timetable <laughs> as a way of calming you down and letting you go to sleep I mean, it's... so we have um we offer free three month subscriptions to calm and we'll include information on how to to get that if you think this that this would be something you'd like to incorporate into and this is where lauren stancil's husband works so they're i i suppose someone could argue it's a conflict of interest not really but it's probably worth disclosing that right <laughs> although we're not asking you to pay anything we're saying no, exactly we'll give you a three a, mm -hmm. a free three month subscription it's worth checking out you know especially you know in these times yeah yeah and they also the only thing i'll add there that just i i think is so cool and is newer they also have content for kids um the most recent one was with thomas the the tank engine i think that's his <laughs> official name so so just content for anyone and everyone from from just my meditation to just sounds to those sleep stories. So lots of good stuff. And Lauren, we have a few questions that have come in. Is it okay if I dive in and just answer those real quick? Okay, great. So a few questions on password managers. Safari has one that comes with Safari. It can generate passwords, it retains them. Um, is that, what are our thoughts on that one? And what are our thoughts on password manager for an all Apple family? Um, so I would say the most important thing is that your passphrase to get into your password manager is extremely strong and you set up two-factor authentication to get into your password manager. Uh, from that, that's, that's gonna be kind of the biggest wall between you and anyone getting access to those password managers. So we had a question also, can LastPass be hacked? It could be if you set up a very weak password and didn't have two-factor authentication, that would be a very bad approach because it would be easy for someone to figure out. But the goal is that with one of those very long passphrases, it's almost impossible for a computer to generate without knowing exactly who you are. And with that two-factor authentication where you have to have a fob, an app, or your phone for a text message, it would be very hard for someone to get in. And if even if someone had your phone, my phone is set up on Face ID and I have a passcode if Face ID doesn't work. So someone can't just pick my phone up off the street and get into my phone. Um, so similar, the one specific to the one with Safari, if that one is only specific to Safari, 
I might not rec I might not suggest using it because you may be on other browsers or in different apps on your phone and need access to your password manager. And if it's only in Safari, it's not going to save your passwords anywhere else. Whereas with LastPass or any of Dashlane, the other ones, you have an app on your phone that you can open, copy and paste the information from the app and then take it to the other app or the other browser you're in. And from your computer, you can be on any browser and have that LastPass or Dashlane or any of those other ones, those um, plugins installed. So that would be similar. Someone asked about the password po program keeper. Um, that would all the same thoughts. And um, one question we had here, this webinar will is being recorded and will be posted online for anyone who missed the beginning or wants to come back to visit. And we will send that checklist to you. So you have all of these action items together. We have one question about when the password manager, oh, uh, the final one, Dave, was just what happens if the password manager is hacked? You're screwed, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing. Make sure you've got a really good password to get into I mean, that password yeah. manager. Well, and the thing is, I'm confident. I I don't yet use LastPass, although I'm going to start using it, Lauren. Yeah, me too. Um, but my guess is it tells you how strong your password is when you actually create a master password. So, yeah, don't create one that it's not telling you is right. really strong, and always use. And you can change that. And you can change that master password. Not that changing passwords is actually the answer to much. It's a strong password that you need, but you can change that password as often as you want, right? For the password manager. Master password. Yeah, the master password. Yeah, and one other thing I just remembered is it will, if you use, a, if you enter a password, it will, and you use it on a different website, it will tell you. It will say this this password fails. You're using it on a, on multiple websites that you have saved within here, and that's a bad idea. Now, it will still let you do that, but it will tell you every single time you go to use it, this is a repeat password, this isn't a good idea. That's good. So you're going to be better off with something like LastPass than doing it on your own. Right. Even if it's not flawless. And that's one thing, when it comes to identity theft, the thing that's important to understand is, as I said at the beginning, there is no silver bullet. There is no single technique that will absolutely ensure that you're safe from identity theft. You have to be, you have to have good habits in general, good hygiene, mm -hmm. good financial hygiene. Um, and you have to recognize that all of these tools and techniques that we've laid out in combination make you look like a hard target. So you right. it's nothing's perfect. If if the GRU, if the Russian government's hacking arm, wanted to hack my identity, I guarantee you they could do it. There's just no way. If the NSA wanted to hack my identity, I guarantee you they could do it. But for the average hacker, I look a little bit like a hard target because I have a lot of layers of protection and between me and the And the two-factor authentication for the password um, systems, I mean, that's the answer. That's huge. That's the answer. You just, yeah. you know, it's yeah. just your phone. And if you don't have your phone, you're right. You're not going to be able to check into something. But uh, <clears throat> that's yeah, better I'll, than someone else being able to get into it. Yeah, and I'll add, there was a follow-up to that question, what if the company database is hacked? And so I'll add a, a piece there. So this is specific to LastPass, again, because I have it, I know this, but I would imagine it's similar for all of the other password managers. Your data is stored locally on your device and encrypted. So my LastPass data is stored on my phone and my computer. It is not stored by LastPass on their servers. They don't even know. So if you lost access, they wouldn't be able to log in and say, yes, here's your password to Facebook that you need. They, It's secret even to LastPass. So it's not stored on their servers anywhere. It's only stored locally where you have the app on your phone, on your on your watch, on your iPad, or you have the, um, the extension downloaded on your browser, on your computer. That's a great That's solution. Huge. Yeah. yeah. Are there any more questions? I, I can't see uh, the question. So. We just got one that says, how about Dashlane? I would imagine Dashlane is the same, but I will do the quick research and follow up with the person who asked. And the only thing I was going to do is re return to something I said at the beginning, and that is we wanted to give you a broad overview of some like good financial hygiene practices and some tools and techniques that you can use to, to just like tidy up your financial life and maybe make yourself a little bit more of a hard target. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to to identity hackers, mm -hmm. um, but this this workshop was not the be all and the end all. We are all available to talk to you individually, as needed, when needed. 
reach out to us, give us a call, give, send us an email. We're 100% available to you. And, uh, and we look forward to you know any follow-up questions later today, tomorrow, anytime. Yeah, and I will just say, because I'm not the one with the expertise, so I can say it, there's actually a lot of expertise here in the firm regarding this. You know, Dave is a technology whiz and all these young people. We <clears throat> actually have, um, you know, a lot to offer if people have questions about things like this. <clears throat> so I guess if there are no more questions online, we're just really really happy that you thank you all for coming an yeah. hour and a quarter with us and uh, uh we look forward to talking again soon good afternoon